Um, and welcome. We're really excited about our speaker series um, this spring through the Southwest Center. Um, there are four events that we're featuring in March and April, so we hope you can join us for the next three. Um, we have um, today, we're just delighted to have Kim Haynes Eitzen join us, um, who's going to speak about her recent book. So also make sure to check out um, her book, which you can find at the bookstore and, and at Antigone. Um, March 22nd, we have Laura Monti coming to do a really interesting um, approach to um, indigenous soundscapes and oral traditions, oral traditions um, in the Invernillo channel, correct? Um, and then Los Lobos and Cultural Politics of Movimiento Music, our very own Esteban Ascona at the Southwest Center, um, April 10th. And then finally culminating um, the evening, Friday evening, uh, April 28th, with um, Tim Hernandez, um, the award-winning author and poet known for his book, um, All They Will Call You, and his partner, Ana Saldana, award-winning musicians. That's going to be in the evening um, performance, Friday, April 28th. So we hope you can join us for that as well. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Gary Nabhan, um, Kellogg professor at the Southwest Center um, and retiring and leaving us soon. So we're just delighted you could be here. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who are in this room and uh, beyond. We have uh, 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 several dozen people zooming in already and we get really good follow up. Uh, thanks to the wonderful work that Carlos does in pushing out notices of all these uh, recordings that he's doing and thanks to Kim for coming in and Robin for organizing this whole uh, section. Um, when I woke up this morning and went out before light to see the snow on the ground in the desert, it was so quiet, like the snow had quieted down the, the birds and the coyotes and everything. And I, I um, thought in an odd way that one of the gifts of Kim's work is that it brings her back in some of the narratives in her book to her own childhood in um, what some of us still call the holy lands, or we could call them the war-torn lands, I suppose, too. But uh, she had an exceptional childhood um, in uh, uh, Palestine, Israel, and other parts of the Middle East that uh, kept in her memory in terms of the soundscapes there and beautiful writing about it. Um, the Sonorous Desert book is one of four that uh, she has written and edited along with many, many um, uh, solely authored and co-authored uh, papers. She's uh, at Cornell in religious studies and received her PhD from University of North Carolina. But what I love about uh, this new book is that it ties together some really, really interesting history of the desert mothers and fathers of um, ancient Egypt, a, a topic that uh, has come in and out of her writing for many years. It brings it front and center in, in relation to some of the issues we're facing today. And I think one of the things is her approach to getting us to open up to deeper listening is at a time when we probably have more divisiveness in the public sphere than ever before. And as one friend said to me, we call them public hearings, but no one comes to listen. <laughs> and so perhaps this uh, uh, gift to us of finding uh, a way to speak about what uh, deep listening means to contemplative traditions of many faiths will bring people back into that daily practice in a way that will heal some of the wounds in our society. So I'm delighted that Kim is here not only for um, a, a talk here today on campus, it's being recorded, but also we usually try to do a community event and uh, she'll be doing that tonight in Patagonia. Arizona and then offering a retreat to people all over southern Arizona uh, tomorrow all day long. So welcome, Kim. We're so grateful. I should say she's a part-time Arizona now with a place over by the Chiricahuas 
And so we hope to see more of her both in Tucson and, and in Southern Arizona at large. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Um, I'm going to try using the mic here so I'm not totally tied to hold hand holding. Um, thank you very much for this invitation to be here. It feels strange and also really wonderful to be in person. I feel very out of practice of actually giving talks in person. So it's a really um, Nice to be here, and thank you for that introduction and for this invitation. So what I thought I would do is um, talk a little bit about this research project that I worked on for quite a number of years that culminated in writing this book, Sonorous Desert. Um, I thought we would do a little listening together. Um, I will welcome feedback, questions, um, your own perspectives on listening. And um, it's my talk is a little bit oriented around a somewhat strange methodology that I used for understanding the development of early Christian monasticism in Egypt, Sinai, Palestine, um, and particularly its sonic dimensions. And what was unusual is that I used my own field recordings in desert environments to create a kind of conversation between the ancient texts I was reading and contemporary desert soundscapes. So I'll, I'll sort of weave that in here, but let's just start by warming up our ear. We have a nice fan going too, but let's listen a little bit here. Okay, so just a little bit to warm up your ears, I'll come back to talking about that. All of those were recorded in that, the image um, of the Sin Wilderness or the Negev Desert. Um, well, let me just start by just, since I'm not exactly sure who all's in the, here with us, um, let me say a few words about what I mean when I talk about desert monasticism. So the corpus of texts that I work on roughly date from around about 300 to 700. Um, I was working primarily on texts written in Greek. We have, an abundant, we have a wealth of material that we talk about in terms of desert monasticism. Um, these are stories of saints' lives. 
These are sayings of the Desert Fathers. Uh, there are monastic rules that come out of this period. And much of them originate in Egypt, but then we've got a, a whole set of texts from Sinai, from Syria, for a variety of reasons. I did not really focus on Syria for this project. Um, certainly from Palestine, the Judean deserts, the Negev deserts, the Sinai deserts. And it's a corpus that gives us insight into two forms, two primary forms of monasticism. One is that of hermits. Um, and our term, our English word hermit, comes from the Greek word for desert. So there was a very close tie for desert and also for solitude. Um, Eremos, Eremia, and this idea that hermits go out into the desert begins to, we see this happening in the fourth century, leaving their villages in Egypt, going out into the desert. Now there is, there's, I, I've given you a map here of Egypt. Um, there tends to be some controversy among scholars of early Christian monasticism about which, whether we should even use the word desert. Um, given that in many cases these are monks who were very close, close closely tied to villages to cities to urban centers but there's also this quest that we see in a lot of this literature to get out of the civilized world to use their their kind of language to get out of the busyness of city life the burdens of city life and go out into some place remote. Um, I've given you this map, just a, a Google map of uh, um, a Google Earth screenshot of Egypt, in part because it tells us something about how close the, the threshold was, how thin the threshold was between this idea of a movement where you're leaving the city, you're leaving your family, you're leaving everything you have and going out someplace remote to a cave, to a ruin. Um, over time, eventually, monasteries are built and uh, in many of these remote locations where communal monks live together. And Cenobites from, from another one, from a Greek word koinonia for community. So um, what, it, what this map of Egypt shows, which is very useful, is that green line that goes down, which is the Nile, which was considered the inhabited area. And the threshold on the one hand between that inhabited area and what would be considered the desert, a stark escarpment going out, being beyond the confines of a city, is really dramatic in, in this kind of an image. Um, let me move. Let me give you a little bit of an insight now um, to the kind of literature that I was dealing with that I've been talking about. So one of the most well-known paradigmatic texts about early Christian monasticism is a text written by an Egyptian bishop named Athanasius in the fourth century, and it tells the story of Antony, the life of Antony. It comes up to resurface over and over um, again in subsequent centuries of Christian monasticism as well. Let me give you just, I'm giving you really a few snapshots here of the kinds of texts that I was asking for information about soundscapes from. Okay, just to give you sort of some challenges that came with, with the project. So here's one from this life of Antony. And here the story is um, a villager, Christian, goes out into the desert, keeps going farther and farther. People come and see him. They want sermons from him. They want healings from him. And he keeps going farther into the desert. So here's one kind of passage. That night, the demons made such a racket that the whole place seemed to be shaken apart. Suddenly, the place was filled with the illusory shapes of lions, bears, leopards, bulls, and sn poisonous snakes. The lion was roaring, wanting to leap on him. Absolutely terrible were the cacophonous ravings of all these apparitions, 
and the howling of their voices. Okay, this is a kind of image, maybe we fantastical image, but it's the kind of little hint we get at something of a monastic soundscape, not necessarily in this case a literal one, but at the very least an imagined one. Gives us some kind of a clue, um, but it also has challenges for what do we do with something about how demons sound. Here's another passage from the sayings of the Desert Fathers. This is a very large collection of sayings that circulated in multiple different forms. Here's one passage that um, has a number of tropes that give us some, again, some insight. One day Abba Arsenius came to a place where there were reeds moving in the wind. The old man said to the brothers, what is this shaking? They said, some reeds. Then the old man said to them, when one who is sitting in Hezekiah hears the voice of the sparrow, his heart no longer experiences the same Hezekiah. How much worse it is when you hear the movement of those reeds. Okay, so there's a lot going on in a little passage like this. There's wind in the reeds, shaking, and of course sound itself is vibration. It is shaking, it is a disturbance, the ideology behind this text is, there are some sounds here that disturb you. And then there is this Hezekiah which is a Greek word, and I am leaving it um, untranslated here because it comes to have so many different meanings. On the one hand, it can mean silence. It can mean stillness. It can mean inner quietude. It can mean peacefulness. It can even in some cases mean, um, uh, did I already say solitude? Silence, solitude, these kinds of inner qualities, but also outer qualities that are quiet, still. One more of a kind of text that we get, another kind of window into the kinds of texts I was dealing with. This comes from a somewhat later text, um, sixth century. We visited the community of a holy elder in the Thebaid, that's in Egypt. And as we arrived at the monastery, Huge dogs used by goat herds were growling on top of the wall. So this is just the tiniest little anecdote in a story about um, in a story about a camel who's drawing water. I didn't give you the whole story because it's a fairly long story. A camel who's drawing water, and the sound of the water wheel makes so much noise that the monks can't hear the call to prayer. And so the camel comes to be trained to stop drawing water every time the monks are called to prayer so that it doesn't cover that sound. So again here, I'm looking at the interplay of different sounds, even in a little story like this. Now that brings me to acoustic ecology. Um, this is a field, there might be some acoustic ecologists right here. So I'm, it's a very complex field of study, and, but emerges out of composition, fields of composition in the 1960s and the 1970s. And I've given you a couple of passages here just to give you a little sense of what is acoustic ecology and why might it be helpful, or why did I find it helpful for my project? So Barry Truax, this comes in the handbook for acoustic ecology, where he says the study of the effects of the acoustic environment or soundscape on the physical responses or behavioral characteristics of those living within it. So this encapsulates a question that emerged for me in the course of my research, which is how do desert sounds come to shape the practice of monasticism? That's the really my, was my guiding question. How does place, how does sound influence practice? Um, another kind of related phrase here, soundscape ecology that I found helpful. 
um, because it attends to all sounds, those of biophony, geophony, and anthrophony, or sometimes called anthropophony, emanating from a given landscape to create unique acoustical patterns across a variety of spatial and temporal scales. So those three pieces, biophonies, sounds of animals, geophonies, the sounds of wind, water, thunder, and anthropophonies were what I began to try to develop. And I, I will say, when I first went into thinking that somehow field recording might teach me something, it was because I wanted to record the sounds of deserts free from any human interaction, any in human interference. This was the, the concept that I had going in. I'm going to record environmental sounds. I don't want the sounds of people. I don't want jets. I don't want, you know, trucks, just pure, pristine. So you can already see the problem that that was going to cause. But I began doing field recordings. I went to the Middle East and made field recordings. And I also came to the Southwest um, and recorded in all of the four North American deserts. Not because I was trying, in this case, to record exactly what the monks heard, but because I was trying to find a conversation between listening now and thinking about the monks in the past, a kind of conversation. Um, so one of the things I did was to sometimes go after specific sounds. And I'll just give you, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna give you a few samples of what I would think of really as signature sounds, sounds that come up over and over in the monastic texts, and sounds that we might hear if we go into desert environments where there are people. Because one of the things that I kept having to be reminded of was that these places were not empty. As much as the Christian monastic texts tried to convince us, there's nobody there, the monks are going there. In fact, there was complex history and complex human history. So here are just some. And as with water, one of the biggest, one of the signature sounds that comes up over and over is the sound of the wind. Um, And I've given you here, um, you can see once I, once I left the, sorry, the, um, once I left off thinking that what I was going to do was capture the, the sounds that the monks themselves heard, I began, began doing more and more recording um, out here in the Southwest. And here, this is, this is a recording um, that I did in the Mojave Desert. I mean, this is an image of me in, um, doing that recording. Um, 
Now, to come back to the Middle East, one of the places where I um, went to record is the site of a, of a monastery that is located just to the north of the road between Jerusalem and Jericho. And this monastery, it's called St. George of Hosea. It's in a, in a, in a canyon, a wadi, um, that has a really long history. And it's a great place to really think about both the complexity of monasticism itself with the combination of solitude and community. You can see on the left here, a communal, a communal monastery that was built starting in the sixth century and then expanded over the course of many years. Um, and further down the, that wadi, further down that canyon towards the, um, very close to the Dead Sea, there's an archeological site, Deir Hajla, where you can see in this top right image, the remains of hermit caves, the remains of a monastery there in, it's, there's actually another monastery that's close by now, but this is really an archeological site. So I went to both of these places to record and to try to capture something of the signature sounds around these, these, this monastery in particular. It was at this monastery where I really had to rethink my idea of not getting any human sounds. Um, because it's, it's a little, I don't know if you can hear the dynamics in this recording, but there's the combination of the stream that's running through the canyon, the birds early in the morning, fairly close to dawn, birds, some wind, and lots of people coming through the canyon because lots of pilgrims come. And this is why I had to really begin to rethink what does that mean to try to strip away or take out humans from an environment where they have always been. Um, and I began thinking more also about anthropophanies themselves, the way in which these monks change the soundscapes of the desert. And one of the, the most um, striking ways to hear that is by listening to the samantron. So here in the lower right is this wooden board that is used by the monks to call the monks for prayer. And it echoes right down the canyon. So it's a very vivid way of talking about or thinking about how the monastic life actually changed the soundscapes themselves. I'll just give you a little bit of this. Okay, so um, I'm going to give you now a listening quiz to see how many different kinds of sounds you can hear now with no visuals. Um, sometimes I find that with the visuals, we already bring in so much of our preconceptions. So just take a listen for this, um, for the variety of what you can hear in a recording like this.
So with a recording like that, what, what all did you hear? Anyone? This is the quiz. Cicadas or some kind of a cricket, some kind of an insect, yeah? What's that? Water? Um, thunder, yes, thunder. What's that? Rain and a train, yes. So um, you might find it a little, okay, so I'm trying to do two things here. I've created, these are, it's like a montage. I haven't manipulated any of these sounds, but I have created a montage to illustrate something of these geophony, biophony, anthropophony in the landscapes that I've been recording. And partly, really, because they bring me back to seeing something I didn't see in the monastic texts about soundscapes, about, so I'll give you one specific example. When I first was, I, this was, um, the train was out in the Mojave Desert. And um, I don't know, have any of you been to Nipton? Okay, it's a really tiny little place. And I thought this is gonna be a great place to do recording. There's not gonna be anybody around. And I stayed right next to the train track. And I thought, how am I gonna deal with that? A train coming through. But then I started when I, this is what I sort of mean by creating a conversation. I would listen to a sound like that and then go back to some of these texts. And in fact, these texts complain about the sounds of human humans all the time. They claim, they complain about noise of machines. They complain about the sounds of war. Um, so they might not have had a train, but there's a really clear, I think, reverberation of that idea of a quest for quiet, a quest for stillness, a quest for solitude, and constantly encountering other humans and other sounds. Um, I've already basically said this. I'm not a historian of you know, 20th century monasticism in the Southwest, but there is a really striking reverberation with all the monasteries that now find themselves coming out of the 60s and the 70s and somewhat earlier come, that have begun to be built in desert environments with sort of an explicit echoing of the historical period that I've been talking about, the third to the seventh centuries. Um, and I, I went to, you know, there are lots of these monasteries, in them. Um, Safford and, and New Mexico and Southern California and um, many in, in Arizona, Utah. So I did go to some of these actually thinking I wanted to see and had some interviews with um, at least in the case of St. Paisius, some, with some of the nuns that were there, about their experience of the soundscapes. And one of the things that's very striking in these monasteries is the use of water as a kind of soundscape or surround sound in these environments. Um, so I wanted to, just by way of concluding, um, and then I, I would love to hear your thoughts questions, critiques. Um, I thought I would just read, this for me has been kind of a guiding um, idea from the composer John Luther Adams. Listening is a primary mode of understanding. As we listen to the world around us, we come to understand more deeply our place within it. Our listening animates the world and the world listens back. I thought I would just end with two, two short paragraphs um, from the book. Our sounding world so deeply shapes our sense of place and our sense of who we are that we often forget to give sound the close attention it deserves. We live in a world of sound. Sounds encircle us, reverberate within our bodies, emanate from above and below. We are enveloped by the sounds of streets and traffic and labor, sounds of birds and trees and wind, of home and family and friends, of dissonance and violence, of voice and of silence. We swim in sound. 
and in turn we shape our acoustical environments and alter the workings of sonic biospheres. Sounds orient us in our world, they animate and enliven our sense of place and entangle us in a reverberant ecology of place, time, and weather. Sounds guide us to food and safety, help us avoid danger and imminent destruction, and foster our sense of mystery, memory, longing, and belonging. They shift our gaze and change our behavior. Humans are not alone in the gravitational pulls of the sonorous. Birds and trees and whales and many other beings are deeply shaped by their acoustic environments. The ancient Christian monks who left their villages and cities for the quiet of the desert knew something we are increasingly recognizing today. The sounds around us shape our sense of place, of who we are, and our feelings of belonging and our feelings of alienation. I'm interested in the ways that monks wrestled with the external sounds of the world, how they cultivated a quality of inner listening and what we might learn about our own world from their experience and their stories. How in the midst of cacophonous surroundings might we cultivate a sense of inner quietude? How might we protect the places that provide us with the solace of birdsong, wind, waves, and so many other natural sounds as our human world, as our world thrums ever more noisy? These questions are at the heart of my inquiry into the past. For me, the desert, paradoxically both noisy and silent, is a compelling place to reconsider our care for the environment. And the first step is to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Yeah. Um, and I also wanted to mention, by the way, my name is Robin Reinecke. I'm at the Southwest Center. Um, and thank you to the lecture series committee for putting this together this year. And your book um, was Gary's inspiration for the entire series. So thank you for, for joining us and for that beautiful um, acoustic experience. Um, I will help facilitate questions. I have one of my own to kick us off. And then we also have Carlos managing questions from Zoom. So um, let us know if you would like to um, ask any questions. So one for you with your book, do you have like an online accessible sound guide or resource? Yes, so with the book, okay, so when I started writing this, I thought I would make a CD and put it inside the book, but CDs went out of fashion. <laughs> so um, it, the book is published by Princeton University Press, and if you go to their website, they have additional resources, an additional resource page, and you can hear the recordings there. Um, what I wound up doing was, for each chapter, I created a collage or a montage of sounds that went with the themes of that chapter. Um, there is also, there's an audio book of it um, on Audible. Not, it's narrated by, um, it's not narrated by me. Uh, she's a wonderful narrator. And there, what, what I've called the coda sections that come at the end of each chapter. So if you read the hard book, you would see there are QR codes. You could get up on your phone, a QR code, then you could listen to the sounds. You can go to the website. And then in the audio book, they're actually narrated. I think they're narrated. There's a short narration that goes with those as a kind of guide with those two minutes. They're about each, each chapter has about two minutes of um, recording that goes with it. And then there's a longer segment at the end of that, I think 30 minutes that also Princeton has on it website. Great, thank you. It's a yeah. fantastic teaching resource as well. And for remote teaching, we're always looking for different ways of engaging students. Yeah. So, um, any questions from the audience in person? Yes, go ahead. Let me just... All sorts of connections I hear, you know, I hear literally in, in, in... All sorts of connections I hear literally. Um, but I'm curious in sort of the, the term deep listening, which yeah. of course comes from Pauline Oliveros. And I'm wondering what you could say about sort of listening as a discipline. Um, in many ways, you're talking about the objects of listening, uh, yeah. what the monks or hermits heard and what they wanted to reject 
right, in some ways. Um, but is there anything in the writing about the discipline of listening, ways to train one's ear um, in the ways that, say, Pauline Oliveros is talking about it in deep listening? Yeah, so this is, okay, so I'm hearing a number of questions in there. One is, do the monastic texts say, talk about deep listening or what that means? That's one question. Yeah, or talk about not necessarily deep listening, but, you know, a discipline of listening. Um. Yes, yes. So they talk, one of the things that is a refrain that comes up over and over in these texts is that you need to be careful. This is a kind of listening. You need to be careful about your thoughts, the thoughts that are running through your mind. Um, logismoi, things that are troubling, things that distract you, things that tempt you. Um, and in that sense, it does, this is a movement that borrows from classical philosophical traditions about the importance of concentration. And how do you concentrate? How do you get sort of, even though the classical, uh, classical philosophical texts don't really talk about it in these terms, but how do you get into a state where you're prepared to shut out everything that's going on around you so that you can concentrate, so that you can go inside. And so in that sense, yes, there is, there's, Hezekiah becomes really in a way for the monastic, the Christian Byzantine monastic tradition, it becomes the key idea or one of the most important ideas, which is how to cultivate that inner quiet, inner listening in the, in the, in spite of, or even in a context where it's noisy. Um, but your question also made me think that one of the things that I found really, well, I, I would say in this, you know, historians in general are very reluctant to talk about his experience. How do you possibly access ancient experience? How do you exper access experience today? But I have to say, I did, I did find that the experience of field recording, you don't quite see it in that one image of me with my, but you basically you put on your headphones, you're trying to completely quiet yourself so you don't capture any of your own sounds in the recording. And when you're so still, you, 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 you know, you're very aware of every sound that you make. And you're also, I think you have a heightened awareness to the sounds that are around you, even if you can't identify them. Because very often I wouldn't want to move to be able to identify a sound. Um, so that is, that's a challenge, that experience. But I do think there is, we certainly catch a window into how to cultivate that sense of inner quiet. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. So we have a question in the chat about tonight's event in Patagonia, if you would like to tell us details. Patagonia. If I get to ask a question too. Yeah. Uh, we're having an, uh, two evenings that Kim is part of tonight at 6 p.m. at the Tin Shed Theater. That's the only theater in Patagonia. Uh, we're um, responding to a 40-minute film called uh, Singing Planet that's about uh, audio or uh, oral ecologists going out and making recordings in wild places. And um, so Kim will be part of that paddle, panel along with Allison Deming and some other people. And then she's doing a workshop tomorrow from 9 into uh, mid-afternoon and then giving a, a free community talk with a slightly different angle than, than this one, but uh, still focused on the, sonor uh, the Sonorous Desert book. So those evening events are free and the workshop or retreat is invitation only with a bunch of uh, uh, oral ecologists who will be in attendance. Um, my question is related to the last one. Um, I remember I was doing a Zoom with one of Thomas Merton's former students, James Finley, and he was talking about centering prayer and as he went into it from his little office in LA, we heard this lawnmower starting <laughs> right below him. 
and and you know all of a sudden 40 people on a chat group said could you do something to stop that and his response was could you uh go deeper into uh, contemplative practice so that doesn't annoy you <laughs> <laughs> But I wonder if there's any time lapses of the same desert fathers or mothers that showed uh, a deepened sense of acceptance of the sounds around them. Um, well, I, I think, so you're asking about, is there like a growing acceptance of the the sounds around you, even as you're cultivating inner quiet. It's like part of metanoia, at least, that you see a transformation of something. Yeah, I, I think, yes. I think when you look at something like um, the writings of John Climacus um, from Sinai, who was the abbot of St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai, the longest um, continuously operating monastery in Christian history, and he really, he really um, shows like the development of this idea of hesychasm or hesychia in his writings, and his writings are filled with sounds, the sound of the sea, the sound of the wind, all kinds of sounds, and yet very much cultivating this inner quietude. Um, there are the pragmatic things, like in monasteries, we can even see, um, we have some papyrus letters of monks and some archaeological remains about historical monasteries that are no longer existing. And there are cases where they're complaining about the sounds of children, children's noise in the monastery. So there are lots of things that are sort of what we would think of as everyday kinds of sounds, maybe seemingly out of place, but then also over time, this development of this idea of inner quietude in spite of that. Yeah. Court, Courtney? Oh, oh. We also, just to flag, we have two questions on the Zoom, but let me come to you and give you the microphone. Thank you. This was really fantastic, inspiring. Um, I, n next time I'm hiking in the desert mountains here, I'll spend le less time worrying about rattlesnakes and more time listening to the to the sounds I hear. Hopefully, yeah. um, but my question is is um, in terms of interpretive methodology, and I haven't yet read the book, so I have to, maybe you, you can send me there if necessary. Um, but I'm sort of curious the extent to which it matters um, for the sort of reconstruction of the experience of the desert monks that the writings about them or by them are sort of literary constructions in nature. Um, you know, hagiography in general is sort of giving us imagined environments, sights and sounds, presumably along with those. So oftentimes these are sort of shaped by, <coughs> you know, earlier models. I mean, biblical heroes who yeah. you know who yep. repeatedly go out to the desert and that's where they can um, practice their sort of unique forms of piety and meet God in different ways um, from you know thinking of Elijah or Moses in the in, in their sort of mountain uh, theophanies yeah um, so I wonder you know I wonder how you sort of approach that just in terms of a, as a kind of a uh, historical method. Yes. Okay. So that's, yeah, it gets to the heart of one of the key methodological challenges, which is all of this literature in a way can be put into this big category of hagiography, writing about the saints that is very idealized. And that it's, that is the case. This is idealized. Much of it is imagined. And you know, we can't positivistically reconstruct much of the early history of monasticism just on the basis of this kind of idealized literature. So my response to that is yes and. Um, they are, these texts are definitely using tropes, biblical tropes. They are idealizing these figures 
And yet there is enough in them at times that seems sort of anecdotal, at times that seems um, not directly relevant to the story they're trying to tell, where we get these little insights, I think, into something of the soundscapes. I mean, so just take that one passage about the wind and the reeds. We could say, well, that's a, a, an ancient Near Eastern trope wind in the reeds, and it is, and wind does blow in the reeds. So you're going to say maybe I'm having my cake and eating it too. Um, so I'm one on the one hand very aware of not being able to say this was the soundscape they heard. And on the other hand, I do want to try to access something of at the very least, could we look at a kind of repertoire of sounds that emerge in these texts? And when we have a repertoire like that, what do we start, what do we hear? So it's, um, yes, it's a, it's a real challenge. And at the same time, I'm not prepared to throw out the texts. And there is sometimes, you know, when, when we get cases of a literary text that's talking about mobs clamoring for the attention of these monks that are supposed to be out there as hermits, there are other kinds of evidence that we can bring in there to somehow corroborate it, temper it. So whether it's um, things like documentary papyri, papyrus remains from monastic sites, um, other kinds of sources that are less rhetorically infused. But yeah, it's an issue. Thank you. I'm just going to go to a couple questions on Zoom. Um, so we have two that are kind of related, so I'll share both of them with you. So first from uh, Jeff Bannister, the Southwest Center. Kim, can you tell us a bit more about how you decide where to record? Um, what do you look and listen for in a given landscape that suggests to you that it would be a good place to record sound? And then uh, Dr. Jennifer Jenkins, also at the Southwest Center, um, has a somewhat related question. Um, she writes, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Could you please talk about the role of ephemerality versus mechanical recording in this listening practice? And then acknowledging, of course, that writing is mechanical recording as well. Yeah, ephemerality was the second part. Yes, um, ephemerality versus mechanical recording. OK, um, so when I started out, I was definitely looking for places where I thought I could get away from the dominance of cars, trucks, planes. So using various maps or um, there are various websites, people who are trying to find you know, these remote spot, spots out west where you can't hear anything. I've, I looked at um, the work of um, Gordon Hempton, who created this one square inch of silence um, up in the Pacific Northwest with the idea that if you have one square inch of silence, and for him, silence means no air traffic, no human, then you've got to have a huge sky space that's, that's free of jet travel. Um, I, over time, I started looking for places with variety, um, where you, if you had water, chances are you were going to have other kinds of life forms. And um, so looking for variety, rich textures. I, the, the hardest thing for me to record was silence. Um, and I'll be doing some talking in Patagonia or talking with people in Patagonia about silence. And I think we all probably have our own definition of what silence is um, but it's an incredibly if you're if we're t thinking of silence as a kind of absence of sound it's a very hard thing to capture um, and probably it's a good thing it's really hard to capture it because um, that in itself teaches us something but um, so there were places where you know i would try to put myself in a place where i was the only person um, and that was also kind of an experiential learning for me. I, I wanted to have an experience of being someplace 
as remote as I could possibly go um, with no one else around. And just to feel what that was like, that was kind of experiential. But then discovering what I could about the soundscapes, what I heard. Um, ephemerality, yes, this is, this is a tricky thing really also about field recording is that in a way, sound of course is always in motion. Once you start hearing the sound, it's already fading away. There's always a sense of motion and fluidity and you know, rise in volume, decay. And in a way I'm freezing time by making a recording. So sometimes I think people, you know, will have different responses to hearing a recording. Um, one of the things I do with my students, I teach a course called Sound, Silence, and the Sacred. And the students have to make a recording every single week. And by the end of the semester, their hearing is so tuned in that they're driven crazy by all the kinds of sounds. So it's going through the library sensors with their earbuds in. I don't know if any, I'd never had this experience, but um, apparently if you're wearing earbuds and you go through the library sensors, they make an incredibly shrill sound. And it's very annoying, but the students would over the course of the semester really become sensitized and they partly did it, you know, by making a recording that froze something in the way that we might make a snapshot. You know, some of them would, uh, they would capture the sound of their coffee maker. And it was the equivalent really in a way of a snapshot, but it was audio. Then they could go back to it and somewhat like a picture. I was just wondering if you had experienced, especially in some of the places you visited, these sort of intentional human sounds like chanting. You think of that as being a, a major component of a, a ritual that you would follow. And so how that fits in. Yeah. Yes. So chanting, I didn't play any. Um, you, I did record the monks at that St. George of Hoseba Monastery in Wadi Kelt. Um, this, I was still in the, the stage of this project where I thought I'm going to record the nice natural sounds of the canyon. It's beautiful, and hopefully nobody there. And then the monks offered to sing part of their liturgy for my recording equipment. And I had to really do a double take because I thought, why would I record? But it was, it was an amazing experience. So yes, chanting. And I don't it would take me too long to swap it out and get it. But if when I listen to that recording now, what's interesting about it is the monks basically sang inside their chapel, but it was open air. So it carries all the way down the, the wadi, the sound of their chant. Um, and you can also hear people talking in the alcove who are just pilgrims coming to visit who weren't expecting the monks to hear because it wasn't part of their regular schedule for the service. So chanting is one. What's interesting also about chanting is there are quite a few texts that talk about how the demons chant just like the monks. And there is, I mean, it's a stylized, I mean, this is a rhetorical thing. They can sound just like you and you have to know the difference. Um, but it also, yes, chanting, saying the Psalms comes up over and over. Um, there are some, some scholars have called the Psalms kind of the, um, the Byzantine, uh, not quite, I don't think I have this quite right, but the Byzantine soundscape would have been hearing the Psalms all the time. This, uh, I alluded to your childhood in the Middle East and could you just talk for a second about coming back to some of those places and your imagined soundstake from your childhood and coming back as an adult? Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so I was born in Jerusalem and, and grew up in Nazareth most of, the t most of the time and then came to the States when I went to college. But um, I think listening was always, sounds were always my way of orienting myself 
to where I was. So I couldn't, whether it was the five times a day um, calls to prayer from the minaret, whatever it was, or it was the sounds of, you know, parties or the sounds of birds. And when I started working on this project, it was striking to me both to revisit places I had gone to, the one monastery we, we hiked a lot as I, was, as I was a child, when I was a child. And uh, we often think of smell as the sense that really triggers memory, but there's also something very much I think about hearing and the sounds that trigger memories. And, um, very powerful in that way. Thank you so much. So we have one more question on Zoom and then we'll probably have to wrap up. Um, we have a question from um, Edwin Perez Osuna. Uh, what does Dr. Haynes Eitzen think of sound design in modern American cinema? Wow, okay. Um, I'm not sure I know enough about the question. So. One of the things I did look into was to think about how films use sound to create a kind of believability and authenticity that in many cases we could say they're complete distortions, they're just completely made up. So I don't know enough about the film industry, but I did look into a little bit like even films with Jurassic, the Jurassic Park movies, you know, how they got the sounds of all those dinosaurs and they were not dinosaurs. And so there's a lot that happens in film that creates a kind of effect. Um, I thought about, you know, using video as a medium, but the, for me to capture the kinds of sounds I wanted to capture would have been very hard to do also as a video. And um, we only did it once here, but I try to really, you know, immersively listen without looking. Um, sometimes it's helpful not to have the visual because another sense will get more heightened. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you to everyone on Zoom for your good